Welcome to this month's edition of Missouri Legislative Update. This month, we're reporting to you from the third floor rotunda at the state capitol. This area of the building directs visitors to each legislative chamber and holds numerous events year round. I'm Jennifer Yapel reporting for the Missouri Senate. And I'm Jonathan Lorenz reporting for the Missouri House of Representatives. The Missouri House put its final stamp of approval on the state's 2014 operating budget. In this month's lead story, we take a look at the decisions surrounding the state's $25 billion budget. Mr. Speaker. The Missouri House put its final stamp of approval on all 13 appropriation bills making up the state's 2014 operating budget. The $25 billion budget includes the largest level of funding for elementary and secondary education in the history of the state. More than $25 million worth of new funding for the state's four-year universities an across-the-board $500 pay raise for every state employee, and more. In response to the current Department of Revenue scandal, lawmakers only funded the department's budget for eight months. If the department complies with the General Assembly's request for more information regarding the current CCW scandal, lawmakers will restore the department's budget. We have to expect that the governor is going to assume what we have told him to assume, which is that we only have eight months worth of money in the budget. We have to be prepared to spend those eight months worth of dollars over the 12 month cycle of the budget. If the governor decides to do that, it is his decision. And his threat yesterday is disgusting, it's dishonest, and it's deplorable. It's an insult to the intelligence of all Missourians. That department is fully funded for long enough that we can come back next year and do a supplemental. The 2014 budget also includes an additional $8.9 million for the Department of Mental Health. Taxes do not grow on trees and some in substance. These are, these are taxes. Uh, taxes come from, from businesses and, and job creators. Uh, they do not come from government. Uh, so it's us to us, up, up to us to be proper stewards of, of the taxpayer money of the state. And I think in this nearly $25 billion budget, we have effectively done that. Following debate, lawmakers sent all 13 of the appropriation bills to the governor's desk for his approval. Senators gave their final approval to the state's spending plan for fiscal year 2014, one day before the constitutional deadline to deliver the budget to the governor. Lawmakers in the Senate focused much of their discussion on funding for Missouri's K-12 and higher education institutions, as well as what some senators called missed opportunities regarding Medicaid expansion. I move the conference committee report on House Bill 2 be taken up for adoption. Funding for education dominated budget talks this session. In total, more than $5.5 billion went to elementary and secondary education in Missouri for the next fiscal year. That's 22.19 cents out of every tax dollar allocated to K-12 education. We, uh, we were able to hold the $65 million increase in K-12 for the highest amount of money K-12 has ever received. So I was very glad we were able to work on that. And then uh, just a, a, a several other things that ended up being compromised positions. Such compromised positions were also found in funding for higher education institutions in the Show Me State. Funding included more than $1.2 billion or 4.88 cents out of every tax dollar for public colleges and universities in Missouri. The largest portion of the state's budget goes to social services, which received more than $8.5 billion for fiscal year 2014. This represents 34.47 cents of every tax dollar collected. During debate, some lawmakers expressed their disappointment for not expanding Medicaid for many citizens in Missouri. Clearly, Medicaid expansion would have benefited hundreds of thousands of working families in Missouri. Uh, they don't have health insurance. Not only that, it clearly would have brought thousands of jobs uh, to our state as we talk about economic development and moving our state forward. Um, I feel we have a moral and an economic responsibility to the people of this state. Uh, when we have opportunity to be able to provide health care to folks and create additional jobs, that we begin moving on some of those opportunities to make life better for those who are here in Missouri. Despite lawmakers' differences, they all agree that crafting the state's spending plan for each fiscal year is a difficult task that takes much preparation and cooperation, described by Senator Schaefer before closing on the final budget bill in the Senate. It is never easy to build a budget, a $25 billion budget, being built like a, it's like building the Empire State Building with a Jenga game. 
all those little pieces. And I understand some people have some of those pieces that they're more concerned about than others, but the committee has to watch out for all the pieces and all the pieces have to hold together. The 2014 fiscal year operating budget runs from July 1st to June 30th next year. And all 13 bills that make up the state's spending plan still await the governor's signature as of this taping. The General Assembly also gave its approval to three supplemental appropriations bills relating to state capital improvements and the maintenance of state office buildings. Senate Communications correspondent Brad Bayshore has more on these bills. It is hard to imagine a Jefferson City without this building. The final passage of House Bills 17, 18, and 19 took place the same week lawmakers and citizens celebrated the 100-year anniversary of the state capitol's groundbreaking held on May 6, 1913. The supplemental bills will allocate money for improvement projects at the state capitol, a building that is known as one of Missouri's most famous and visited landmarks. Senate Appropriations Chairman Senator Kurt Schaefer of Columbia handled the measures in the Senate and explains how much extra general revenue will be used at the capitol and to possibly build a new office building for the Missouri Department of Transportation. On some of the additional general revenue that we know that uh, we're going to end up with, we've come to an agreement with the House and the Governor on four items for that. That's what's in the sub, um, and that would be the $38 million uh, for the construction of a new uh, MoDOT building, uh, also $50 million in repairs for maintenance uh, tuck pointing and windows for the Capitol. During debate, uh, Senator Paul Lavota of Independence inquired about how extra general revenue estimates within the bill were crafted and how pending legislation at the time relating to tax reform could affect the supplemental budget request. How about the concern that if it's not as high that we don't pass some of this tax amnesty, uh, the, the bill we worked on last night is another $26 million this this year i mean you think we'll still be okay if we spend this money and still have yes, that I extra do. revenue i do house bills 17 18 and 19 now move to the governor's desk for the same consideration as the state operating budget bills reporting for the missouri senate i'm brad bayshore members of the missouri house approved a proposal aiming to protect the second amendment rights of all missourians supporters claim they are protecting missourians gun rights from the federal government while opponents believe they are doing more harm than good. I hate to see us. The Missouri House put its final stamp of approval on a proposal aiming to protect the gun rights of all Missourians. House Bill 436 creates the Second Amendment Preservation Act. The proposal makes all federal gun laws intended to infringe upon Missourians' Second Amendment rights null and void. It also creates a Class A misdemeanor crime for any federal government employee who enforces any federal law which infringes upon someone's Second Amendment rights in the state. The best authority, the closest authority, and the enumerated authority to regulate guns in the state of Missouri rests within the law enforcement officers within the state of Missouri. In addition, the proposal includes language allowing school districts to arm teachers. It also lowers the age eligible to receive a concealed carry endorsement from 21 years to 19 years. However, opponents claim the bill misses the mark and does nothing to keep guns off the streets. Because the easier we make it to purchase a weapon, whether it be legal, illegal, this bill is going to do it. And yet we're turning our back and the kids in your district, kids in my district, we're not doing a darn thing like you mentioned. Lawmakers approved the Second Amendment Preservation Act with more than 115 yes votes. The proposal now heads to the governor's desk for his consideration. The General Assembly approved another measure relating to firearms. Senate Bill 75, among other provisions, aims to teach children about gun safety and addresses how to prepare for dangerous or armed intruders in schools. Senate Communications correspondent Brad Bayshore explains. It seems that we uh, mandate in schools tornado training, fire training, and other training. Senate Bill 75, sponsored by Senator Dan Brown of Rolla, was pre-filed exactly one day before the tragic school shooting in Sandy Hook, Connecticut. The measure would allow school districts and charter schools to provide training and education on how students, teachers, and school employees should respond to threatening situations or armed intruders. Part of the program includes a simulated active shooter and intruder response drill. There are a lot of things that can be learned that hopefully will save lives or disable the shooter and, uh, and stop this insane madness before it 
uh, gets too far. Another part of the training includes the teaching of the Eddie the Eagle gun safe program to first grade students. The short animated video teaches young children the dangers of firearms. If you start a gun, just walk away. During debate, several senators from across the aisle welcome the idea of allowing schools to teach firearm safety because of the consequences involved. You know, I, I liken your EDA, Eddie Eagle program very much to the D.A.R.E. program when we were going through exactly. uh, elementary school and they, they said, you know, here's the, here's the effects of drugs, this is what it looks like, you know, don't do them because it has irreparable consequences for your life. Whether you're a gun owner or not a gun owner, this is the type of stuff you should be teaching your kids and it's a shame that we have to create a cartoon to have parents or adults teach our kids this very basic stuff. Right. Some senators also question the need to spend valuable class time and teacher resources on training that does not directly affect traditional education. How are you going to uh, distribute adequate um, educational practices in mathematics and, and science. Those are the considerations that we have as school board members and when you add on the length of annual continuing training for four hours, that takes away from student education. We have too many of our children <clears throat> that need help in the areas of math and science who are below proficiency in a major way in those areas and if we have the opportunity to put resources behind teachers and training, I think it should go towards those children that are, again, below proficiency. The bill sponsor had the last word before the Senate approved the measure by a vote of 24 to 5, sending it to the governor for his action. A lot of angels were gone after Sandy Hook, after Colorado. Uh, I pray to God that never happens again, and I hope if it happens that we can respond more effectively and disable that shooter as soon as possible. Other provisions found within Senate Bill 75 deal with Missouri's concealed carry permit process, the sharing of records and databases with the federal government, and regulations for sheriff's departments throughout the state. Reporting for the Missouri Senate, I'm Brad Bayshore. The Missouri House of Representatives truly agreed and finally passed a proposal aiming to protect the state's number one industry. In this next story, we take a look at how lawmakers hope to ensure the future of agriculture in Missouri. You know, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm... Members of the Missouri House put the final touches on a proposal aiming to protect agriculture in Missouri. House Joint Resolution 11 proposes a constitutional amendment affirming one's right to farm in Missouri. The proposal also includes language protecting the rights of farmers and ranchers to engage in modern farming and ranching practices. It's about the family farm. It's about preserving for generations what we have, right. uh, we've and grown to love in, in Missouri. The proposal made several trips back and forth between the House and Senate as lawmakers on both sides of the building worked to develop a compromise on the issue. Earlier versions of the constitutional amendment placed restrictions on the abilities of local governments to pass laws affecting farmers. And we're left with a piece of legislation that guarantees the right to farm, but yet still has a reference to the constitutional authority of those um, dedicated and allocated um, political subdivisions to be able to exercise their right to their own ordinance. Lawmakers approved the proposed change to the state's constitution, with more than 130 yes votes. The right to farm language now heads to the voters for approval. Up next on Missouri, legislative update. One of the state's top newsmakers sits down with one of the lawmakers in charge of the state's pocketbook. That's after the break on Missouri, legislative update. When some people struggle with their mortgage payments, they become frozen, petrified. Not knowing what to do, they do nothing. But the people who take action are far more likely to get the most positive outcome. Making Home Affordable is a free government program. Call now to talk one-on-one -on -one with a housing expert about the options that are right for you. Real help, real answers, right now. Welcome to our Capital Dialogue segment. We have with us on our program today Rick Stream, who is the House Budget Chairman. He's from Kirkwood in his first year as chairman of the House Budget Committee, but he's been on the Budget Committee all his legislative career pretty much, and we're glad to have him with us today because the budget now has been sent to the governor, and you've done it before the deadline, and it's about $25 billion. 
Uh, it's significant that you and I are sitting in a room where they used to hold appropriations committee hearings many years ago, and we're sitting about where they used to have the table for the committee. So we're kind of visiting old times when we've talked from the House lounge today. You, got, you, you get, your committee gets the first real look at the budget before it goes over to the Senate, and you get the first big take or the first big cuts or the first big expansions of it. Let's walk through that process a little bit. You come in in December, you have a few things that you can start work on, but the governor presents a budget in January. Then you start to dig in. How do you go about that when you've got a $25 billion package in front of you? Sure. Uh, we first of all start in uh, late November, December with the consensus revenue estimate, which is the guideline by which the state will will uh, spend its money for the next fiscal year, the year that we're uh, doing the budget for. So. Uh, the Senate does an estimate, the House does an estimate, and the Governor's Office does an estimate. And these are these are estimates using data from economists, and we determine then what our uh, consensus revenue estimate will be for the fiscal year that we're doing the budget for, which in this case is fiscal year 14. So that's the first step. Uh, that that uh, directs uh, all three um, groups uh, as to what kind of a budget they're going to submit, how much money is going to be in the budget. So the, as you pointed out, the governor submits his budget in the state of the state. Uh, this year it was the end of January, uh, and, he, and he gives uh, the, both the House and the Senate his budget in budget books at that point. Now, prior to that, our uh, appropriations committees could have been doing some work on last year's budget to see where the money was uh, actually allocated and to do oversight. But with uh, with an election last uh, November, we had all new committees uh, for the most part, a lot of new people on those committees. So we really start the process in January with those committees. Uh, so but once the governor gives us his budget, then we begin to work on it immediately. Uh, in the House, we have six uh, appropriations committees that feed into the full budget committee. The appropriations committees, in, starting in early January, start to go call in the departments f uh, and, t and get testimony from witnesses in the departments about where they're spending their money uh, and that's the, that's the beginning of the oversight process on our for our appropriations committees once we get the governor's budget then we can actually see what he has uh, in his budget and determine if we want to make some changes to it my direction this year to the appropriations chairs was to look at every aspect of the budget bills that they had in front of them to determine if there was anywhere that we could save money number one and provide uh, better services to the people of Missouri. Uh, that was the purpose of, of their, uh, their uh, uh, committee meetings, was to look into that. And they did a really good job of it this year, I think. So <clears throat> we, uh, the budget, House has to get the budget to the Senate by the end of March. So between the end of January this year and the end of March, we had to have the whole process done. So it was a pretty fast track this year. Uh, again, we had a lot of meetings, the budget committee, uh, began to meet um, as soon as the appropriations committees were in the full swing. Uh, and we, we put together a budget that I think is, is very responsible. It's balanced again. Uh, it puts the priorities of Missourians first. Um, and uh, when we got through in the House, we, uh, we sent it over to the Senate. But I think the process in the House was very good. We, we, did, we were able to save a lot of money and use that money toward funding some priorities that had not been funded in a while, like uh, we put a lot of emphasis on mental health this year because of situations around the country and plus the fact that it had been kind of neglected the last few years, certainly. So we added money for mental health services at, in several different areas. A significant dollars went into mental health. We added a lot of money to um, K-12 education, 66 million. It's the largest amount we've ever funded the foundation formula. We added 25 million to higher education. We added money for Bright Flight scholarships, Access Missouri scholarships. We added money for uh, urban teaching programs in the school districts that are really struggling right now. We uh, added a lot of money for um, tourism, not as much as they wanted, of course. Uh, we funded a, a new medical facility or program at MU with a corresponding program down in Springfield. Again, a lot of uh, additional money was put into the budget in areas that we thought would have the most uh, positive impact on the lives of Missourians. Is our budget back to the level it was before the recession? It's close now. Um, we were, 
And the way I determine that is uh, we were collecting about $8 billion in general revenue uh, the second year I was in the legislature. And uh, that drops considerably when the economy tanked um, because the general revenue is money that's collected in taxes for Missourians. It's income tax, that's the biggest one, sales tax, capital gains tax, corporate tax, uh, use tax. And so I tell people taxes don't fund our government, prosperity does. If people are working, then they're paying all of these taxes, and businesses are too. So uh, we've, we're back to right around $8 billion, but I, I think we're still below slightly, um, but we're, we're getting closer. Um, but there's, there's been an increase in federal dollars, and uh, there's, there's been a slight increase in what I call the other funds too. One of the things I, I like to talk to appropriations or budget chairman about in the House and Senate at the end of the process is, as I watch hearings well at the beginning of the process, and I see not only agencies and bureaus and organizations come in, I see individuals come in saying they need money for this or this program should have money. But you know that you never have enough. How difficult is it to be hard-hearted enough to tell these people, sorry, no? Did you have to steel yourself to that at all? Well, um, yes. Uh, it's like dealing with your children. They'd like to have a lot of money too and you just have to say no. And I was on a school board for 12 years in Kirkwood and we had faced the same problem there too where you, we asked, we told the administration, if you want this new program, you're going to have to tell us where to cut one of the other ones. And every one of these programs that is not funded up to the level that folks wanted to, or if you have to make a cut, we certainly had to make cuts uh, during the recession. Uh, those are difficult to do because they affect people's lives. So they're hard, but what we, our job, that's why we're here, is to make those tough decisions to balance the needs of all Missourians and try to make the best decision for, for everybody, considering what the needs are and um, who needs the money the most. And that's why my philosophy has always been uh, try to help the people who have, can help themselves the least, uh, the, this, the handicapped, the disabled, the mentally ill, the, the very poor uh, young women with children, the, the elderly poor. Those folks uh, have the most difficult time helping themselves. That's where our first focus should be, I think, personally. That's just my personal opinion, uh, as opposed to some of the other programs where um, folks are able to go out and work and, and make ends meet. When we come back, Bob Pretty of the Missouri Net continues his discussion over the state's operating budget for fiscal year 2014 with State Senator Scott Sifton. Stay tuned. So, same time next week? Well, of course. Senator Scott Sifton is our guest on this part of Capital Dialogue. Senator Sifton is a rookie in the state Senate. He served two years in the House before he moved over to the smaller chamber. And he's been a member of the Appropriations Committee or the Senate Budget Committee this year, uh, divvying up $25 billion. How, it se $25 billion seems like a lot of money. Absolutely. But when it comes to divvying it up among all of the agencies, divisions, boards, commissions, and so on in state government, $25 billion isn't a whole lot when you start looking at that, is it? Well, uh, general revenue accounts for approximately a third of the total, so the, the money that we actually have discretion over is approximately a third of the state budget. Much of the rest uh, is uh, pass-through dollars, uh, federal money, so we actually only have discretion over a portion of that entire amount, and we spend most of our time focused on that. $7 billion is still a lot of money to you and me. Absolutely. But at the same time, again, with all of the things the state government does and has obligations to do, $7 billion doesn't go as far as a lot of people would like it to go. No, and actually the aggregate size of the state budget has stayed about the same over the last 10 years. We have not seen a lot of growth in the just dollar size of government in Missouri, uh, and that's despite having had modest inflation, but inflation nonetheless. So our, our government has gotten smaller over the years. You do have indications, though, that things were going to get better. 
in terms of state income and the support it can give services. Yes, well this year was the first year in several that we've actually had revenue growth that has given us some, some additional spending authority. Um, in the two years I was in the House, we cut almost a billion dollars out of the state budget in those two years. This year we saw a little bit more than a hundred million dollars in revenue growth uh, under the consensus revenue estimate and probably more than that overall by the time everything is said and done. And so that's given us some flexibility that we just haven't had uh, in the years following the downturn that we had. I've been in a lot of your hearings in the House and the Senate through the years and I'm always struck by how difficult it must be when people come before you and say we really need this. They're not just lobbyists, they're not just agencies, but they're folks yes. who come to you and they say we really need this kind of help. It must be really difficult to say no to them. You know, I will tell you, in particular in the Appropriations Committee, we hear a lot from folks who advocate for the disabled, for the mentally ill, uh, for school children who need a ride to school, uh, for, uh, you know, education for college students for, for uh, the K-12 formula, um, and a lot of other very important priorities, uh, transportation. I mean, we have a lot of different things to balance. And uh, even though this year we had revenue growth, we still aren't able to do all the things that many of us would like to be able to do uh, to try to help make our state a better place for people in need. You're a minority member of the Senate. You're I am. one of the 10 Democrats. Yes. And so that means you were very much a minority member of the Senate Appropriations Committee. Yes. Are the, are the, are the priorities for the state in terms of spending its money where you would like to see them be? You know, I, I felt it was very important for us to move forward on Medicaid expansion this year, so needless to say, I'm disappointed that we were not able to include that in the budget. Um, and I think that's, if you had to ask me what my biggest disappointment is in the budget process this year, it's the fact that we, we don't have any money for Medicaid expansion. Uh, that said, we, we did do some very good things this year, and in particular, there will be about $65 million in new funding for uh, the elementary and secondary education funding formula, which will not only help school children, it will also help local property taxpayers who otherwise might be asked to pick up more of the tab, which is a very important issue in my district. Uh, we were also able to put a little less than $35 million in, in new funds to higher education, which um, will help to keep the lid on tuition increases in our state. How about social services? You know, we, we were able to do a few things uh, this year that we haven't been able to in the past. Um, needless to say, the social service budget has been under um, tremendous pressure uh, uh, through the uh, recession years. Um, we've been able to restore some things, um, you know, never as much as, of course, you'd like to be able to do. In, in particular, I think uh, mental health uh, has been a, an emerging topic of conversation. We have great need with the state hospital in Fulton. Uh, that's an outmoded facility that we're working very hard to try to find a way to replace. Um, and you know, needless to say, with uh, uh, Sandy Hook and many of the other uh, tragedies we've had uh, in recent years, um, I think the importance of, of uh, making sure that we provide adequate mental health funding is, is um, as salient now as ever. And, and, and I'll tell you, that's one of the big issues with Medicaid expansion. Um, you know, if we don't get the dish payments from the federal government, local hospitals are going to have to make difficult choices about uh, the services they provide. And there's a lot of concern that um, mental health uh, beds are going to be among the first cut by hospitals who are going to lose federal money if we don't expand Medicaid. And that's why I think it's so important that we do it. That's all for this month's edition of Missouri Legislative Update. If you have any questions about the legislation that appeared in this program, you can log on to senate.mo.gov. There you'll find the contact information for the 34 members of the Missouri Senate, as well as our newsroom website. I'm Jennifer Yapel reporting for the Missouri Senate. And I'm Jonathan Lorenz reporting for the Missouri House of Representatives. If you have any questions regarding anything going on in the Missouri House, you can visit our website at house.mo.gov. For all of us with Missouri Legislative Update, thanks for watching. And we hope to see you again next time as we wrap up the 2013 legislative session. Until next time, thanks for watching.